Good morning, everybody. Happy Mother's Day to those, to those that are watching. My name is Brenda Sullivan. I am the owner and host of Living and Loving Herbs um, podcast. If I can get this up there. All right. There we go. I'm learning all the technology. So um, we're going to be going live on Clubhouse in a few minutes. So I just want to say Happy Mother's Day to everybody. And today we're going to be talking about um, honoring our mothers and talking about some of the things that they have passed down to us, herbal remedies, little little things like that, because usually they're, you know, Dr. Mom. And um, so we're going to be going live with my friend, Teresa Valdendez. She is the my co-host on Clubhouse, and I need to hop over to Clubhouse. Um, so if you haven't signed up for my newsletter, there's the, uh, the, um, the URL. And I just got to figure this out. I'm, I'm signing in here to, I'm coming, Teresa, I'm coming. And here we are. Okay, so we are now live on Clubhouse. So if you're not on Clubhouse, come along on Clubhouse. So um, we are going to, let me just get rid of some of this stuff. So anyway, um, uh, as I said, I'm Brenda Sullivan. I am the, this is my live broadcast every Sunday at 10 o'clock. Um, so we are um, going to talk about um, herbs and the lifestyle podcast. And what we do is just, we just chat, my, Teresa and I, and we have an, a couple of other people that, that come in um, that share with us uh, their herbal wisdom. You don't have to be an herbalist. I am an herbalist. I uh, do what they call um, wise woman herbalism, which is uh, a tradition that um, I don't do clinical. I don't treat people other than my family. Um, and I also um, treat, uh, well, I share my, my education, what I know with others in my community, in my my immediate family. And, w and this is an outreach of my formal education. I'm a, um, a uh, going through classes on the, um, hey, Teresa, let me make you moderator. Good morning. Happy, Good morning. Mo happy Mother's Good Day. Happy <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt you. The sound <laughs> after the fact. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I'm just doing introductions on YouTube. So, um, yeah, I usually try and start a few minutes early. But anyway, I I am a wise woman tradition, which just means that I don't I don't work in a clinical setting. Um, due to my family life and my daughter, I just treat my daughter and my husband, and I share my herbal wisdom to my family and friends and my my wider community. I am finishing my uh, advanced studies, and this is part of the outgrowth. Is you know, the podcast and the newsletters um, is just an outgrowth of this education. Um, they want us to do some kind of community service. So this is this is my answer to, to community service. So anyway, let me introduce you. This is Teresa Valdendez. She is the co my co-host and my 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 friend. We're neighbors down, you know, we live in the same neighborhood and God bless this woman. She comes on every Sunday and um, she is a life coach, health coach. She has her own show, her own everything. I have her website up on the on YouTube. Make sure you uh, hop over to her website and you give her some love on all the social media outlets. So Teresa and we have Deborah here. Good morning, Deborah. Welcome to Living and Loving Herbs podcast. We're just uh, doing introductions. I'm also live on YouTube. <laughs> and this is my outgrowth. So anyway, welcome, welcome. 
Thank you, Brenda, for that warm welcome. And uh, yeah, I'm so excited to share stories here. Um, as you said, I'd like to uh, focus on wellness, uh, especially women's wellness. And I am just so looking forward to today's show. I love it every Sunday when I come and spend time with you. But today um, has special meaning for me because as a mom and uh as somebody who grew up with mother figures and, and of course my mom, but and also mother figures who uh, pass down traditions of what it means to have uh, food, the importance of food and whole foods and herbs and herbal remedies. Uh, so I'm really excited to share these stories. And uh, Deborah, I am. Um, Deborah is a, a friend and colleague, and I can't wait to, I'm so excited to have her over here. She's a confidence coach. I met her in a workshop, and we became fast friends. So happy to have you up here, Deborah, and join us today. Morning, ladies. How are you today? I saw your name pop up on my screen, and <laughs> I've got just a few minutes as I'm getting ready to head out, but I'm going to grab some nuggets from you ladies and and so I'm anxious to hear what you have to offer and uh, just glad to be here and be a part this morning. So well, Deborah, I'm done speaking. Thank you for joining us, Deborah. Yeah, and we're happy to have you. Uh, again, uh, as we always say, you can leave when you need to, um, participate in as, as much or as little as you want. And we're just uh, grateful to have you here. So thanks for joining. Yes, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you. And I have been following you on Facebook and I haven't been able to participate because I'm kind of figuring all the stuff out as we go along. So um, we are um, here to talk uh, to honor mothers and um, whether you are a mother or not, that doesn't matter. You came from a mother or you have mother figures in your life that uh, pass down wisdom. I was lucky enough. Um, my mother was very instrumental in a lot of the things that I do today. Thank you, mom. Love you. And um, my grandmother, I learned a lot from my grandmother. And um, today we're going to talk about some of the herbal remedies. I, you know, as as a Deborah, I don't know if you know this, but I like books. I write my own books. As you can see right behind me, I have also the owner of farmtobath.com. So um, I have a small micro farm behind me. And um, I grow lots of herbs. And I'm in the process of working on my advanced herbalism uh, certificate. I've been working on this for ooh, about five, six years at this point. So I'm in my final stages and um, I just, you know, I, I love herbs. I love to talk about herbs. I love to talk about the history. I love to talk about the women that uh, inspired um, all of us. Uh, we have, you know, herbalism goes back to the ancients way, 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 way back um, to the beginning of time when there were no medicine, no Western medicine or we say pharma, pharmaceutical medicine. And, um, the ancients called to me, and um, for me, it's I'm always looking for some um, some great wisdom. I am a collector of books. I like historical books. I have a history, um, a uh, what you say, uh, colonial history background, American studies major, and you know these great old ladies. You know the family nurse. How many remember the family nurse? I mean, we all have them in our families, our great grandmothers, our grandmothers. My my great grandmother came over from Sweden, and um, she raised thirteen children in the wilderness in in upstate Washington State. And let me tell you something: there's nobody there. I mean, the, the area that they um, were lived was a farm, and there was like population of I think they were the biggest family. They had thirteen kids. Um, to this day, I think the population is like 20 or 30. It's a very small town. And you bet she had to learn how to do a lot of this stuff. And I am just, you know, some of the things that I've come across. So for my first thing that my mother taught me for, um, was, uh, for herbalism was gargle with salt water when you have a sore throat. And she used to always tell us to gargle. And the other thing was cranberry juice. Um, my mother also, when you had bladder issues, and believe it or not, there's 
all these years later, I'm almost 60 at this point, um, there is good research that out there that tells you, um, my daughter has a disability and um, she has frequent bladder infections. And that's one of the things that the kidney specialist had told me was to start giving my daughter uh, cranberry juice to help balance the, the, uh, the pH in her bladder. And to this day, we give her cranberry juice. Uh, none can't be sweetened, has to be unsweetened. So that's my herbal tidbit. Anybody else like to share your, your, your uh, herbal remedies from your loved one? Brenda, thank you so much for sharing. I'm going to share real quick. Again, I've got to scoot out and walk in. Um, one of the things that my grandmother, and I don't know if it's her as y'all are talking about herbal, but the one thing that she always said to me was some kind of Vic Sab. And so if we had any kind of throat or neck or whatever, it was putting a little bit of Vic Sab on our feet. So I'm sure that comes from somewhere natural, mm -hmm. and I don't do it today. But that was the memory that came across to me this morning. So uh, thank you for sharing. And, and salt, yes, gargle with salt always was another <laughs> thing as well. So well, precious memories. Both of all my people are gone now. And so precious memories this morning. And I love how you're integrating the, the goodness that they've done for us along with this Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to you both. Thank Deborah you, Deborah. Thank speaking. you for joining us. That was great. Awesome. Uh, Deborah, yes, uh, another variation of the uh, Vic salve on the feet was the crushed onion. <laughs> crushed onion on the feet in socks, it, it stinks, but yeah. uh, apparently it works. Um, one of the things that I remember, we also had the gargling uh, with salt and lemon mm -hmm. or sores, but um, one of the ones I remember was Right as uh, flu and cold season would begin, uh, we would have a lot of extra garlic in all of our food. There mm -hmm. was raw garlic, there was cooked garlic, there was garlic here, garlic there, garlic, garlic everywhere. And it was just kind of sprinkled in um, as a way to help boost immunity mm -hmm. in anticipation of cold and flu season. And I, I'm pretty sure it worked. Uh, to mm -hmm. this day, I still add a lot of extra garlic or make sure that I have garlic in my food a lot. Yeah. <laughs> pressed garlic. Yeah. Freshly pressed garlic. So I'm Teresa and I'm done. Yeah, the, um, the garlics, the allium family um, is... Uh, is is great when we make a uh, fire cider which is uh has a lot of horseradish and garlic and onions um the garlic opens up it thins the mucus so when you eat it you know when we make our our um our garlic and honey fermented garlic and honey and we take that the reason why we take the honey is because it has natural immune boosting properties to it but the garlic also releases and thins that mucus. So probably the reason why, well, you could do a reflexology on the feet. You know, Deborah was talking about how, you know, she, the, the VIX, well, it's the vapors on our feet and it and, and absorbs through the skin. And, you know, sometimes the further, it's too strong up here. I mean, my mom used to slather us with VIX. I wouldn't use VIX today to save my life because it's, um, it's made out of petroleum. Um, but, it's the menthol, it's the vapors. And sometimes you put it down at your feet because that's the only place, it's so strong. That's the only place that um, <laughs> you still get the benefit of it. Um, and it gets absorbed through your through, through your feet. So um, yeah, some of these old wives tales are, are, are pretty cool. So I have, do um, you have any others, Teresa, that you wanna, we've less, lost Deborah. she's moved on. She's had to, um, she's got family commitments today. So it's just, uh, I don't know if Anne's gonna join us or not today. So maybe just you and I talking about our past, our grandmothers and our mothers. Yeah, I just remember, uh, you know, what I mentioned earlier about onion as a salve um, also. And um, uh, chamomile, mm -hmm. chamomile tea, um, mint tea was always uh, great for, was always given to us if, uh, or offered if anybody had a tummy ache or had eaten too much. 
um, chamomile tea for for with honey for mm -hmm. uh, cold as a cold remedy. Um, but my uh, my maternal aunt, <laughs> this is a interesting story. Uh, my aunt Dina lived with us most of the year, and she was a mother figure for me. She for for both me and my sister. My parents worked a lot, and she was always uh, preparing all these meals. And she had this huge book. I'm talking encyclopedia size book with tissue paper thin pages that she would go over with a magnifying glass and read all about herbs. And she would talk about it. And honestly, I was a, a kid and a teenager. I mean, this was throughout my life. And I would just kind of, um, <laughs> I would just kind of roll my eyes. But she would make like these jam packed soups for us in winter, like a fish soup with carrots and celery and <laughs> onion and all of this stuff. And then she would open the book and she'd say, okay, carrots, this is what carrots do for you. Celery, this is what celery does for you. And you know why I put all this extra onion? Let me tell you. So there was this, um, this, this uh, familiarity that I had with my uh, aunt sharing all of this information. Even if I had a bruise or if I bumped myself, she'd swear by it. She'd say, you want me to crush up an onion for you? <laughs> 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 oh, and yeah. I would laugh because you know this was the uh, late eighties, nineties, and you know why? Why have a crushed onion when you can go and get this cool smelling Vicks? I always loved the smell of Vicks. Yeah, I don't you know, know what you're talking about. <laughs> you know, I, that's something that I learned at the farmers market, and I just there was a group of ladies. They were Latino, and I make a um, a a. a uh, chest rub and it has eucalyptus and uh, peppermint and cr menthol crystals in it, and stuff is strong. It'll it'll peel Paul wallpaper off the wall. And these ladies were like snorting the sample that I'd have out on the table, and they would be in heaven. Yeah. I was, <laughs> Like yeah, this stuff is me. awful. I love it. <laughs> it's yeah, I just it's just it's not a, a, a set so yeah, I learned I learned that it was uh it this I don't know, it's it's cultural, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> well, sometimes maybe, maybe it's cultural. I don't know. It's also preferences. Some people, I mean, even in, in it, within cultures that eat very spicy foods and like strong smells don't enjoy them. So yeah. Yeah. Who knows what it is? I really wish I had my aunt around now with all of her stories and her wisdom that she would share about uh, food and nutrition. Back then, you know, if it came out of the earth and it was something that you grew in your backyard, it mm -hmm. wasn't cool. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd go to the Calamata, we'd go to the farm and sure we liked uh, you know i used to love climbing up a tree and bringing down lemons mm -hmm, and stuff but mm -hmm. it wasn't as special as when i went to the store the novelty of a bottle of lemon juice do you mean i don't have to climb a tree and i don't have to squeeze <laughs> it myself <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah part of it has to do with the sign of the times you know we got so uh um uh romanticized by mass-produced well, you know, it was it's marketing, massive. slick marketing. Yeah, but we also didn't know. We didn't know about preservatives. We presumed mm -hmm. that if somebody put it on our table, it was okay to eat. Yeah, so yeah. It yeah. was a, a bit of naivete, if you will. Well, and I think, I, I, I don't think the manufacturers did us any any service. You know, I you know the hungry man TV dinners, those horrible, horrible TV dinners, but yet we were conned into believing that they were, uh, that, that that was, that was the thing, you know, that it was healthy and you could, you could have your TV dinner and watch your, your shows. And, you know, I think for a lot of it, it's just, um, mothers had to go back to work and there wasn't any, um, time to make the stuff from scratch. Um, and I think that's part of, part of the problem is that, you know, a lot of this stuff takes time. You have to go to the farm. Mm -hmm.
You have to go pick your, your, your lemons. You have to squeeze your lemons. And, you know, a lot of people have a busy life and they don't have time for this. Um, yeah. And, and, and it, it, it is part busyness, part um, uh, resources mm -hmm. and access. And part of it is learning. Like I realized when I had, um, when I needed, to, when I went down my journey, and I'm not going to go there now, but when I, that, that whole foods really mattered mm -hmm. and that what comes from the earth, uh, keeping it clean really mattered. And then as I came to that realization myself, I started remembering all of these things. My grandmother, my Greek grandmother's garden with her herbs where she would go out and pick the dill and put it in the Um, You know, she'd tell me to go get a fetch a lemon from the tree, mm -hmm. the eggplant that came out of her veggie garden, all of that stuff, right? Um, really nutrition from from the earth, mm -hmm. whole dense nutrition. And there, this sprinkling of garlic everywhere. I mean, the Mediterranean diet is one that is just not a fad. It keeps coming no, back. I saw that article. I saw that yeah. article on your on your Facebook page about Alzheimer's. The Mediterranean diet can reduce the the symptoms of Alzheimer's. That was a great article. I love that. Yeah. So I mean, food is medicine, mm -hmm. right? So food is medicine, and and that's part of what um, I love about your your passion your with your work is it, it reminds me so much of my childhood it reminds me so much of all that wisdom that I got from my from my family in Greece but also you know my American grandmother she used to say all the time eat the rainbow yeah. and all I could see was that I had chores and I had to clean more pots and pans <laughs> why do you need a pot for this and a pan for that and a pan yeah, for yeah, yeah 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 <laughs> um, oh, I remember so yeah we used uh, Paul's um, my husband's uncle. Um, he was a bachelor. He was a, a old school Italian, and um, he ended up living with us for a while. And uh, back in the day, you know, things were things. Money was tight. Paul and I were trying to figure out how we were going to, you know, manage Katie's care. He needed help. He couldn't live on his own anymore. He had some serious. Um, uh, medical health. He had ended up having bladder cancer and um, uh, diabetes on top of it. This this guy was didn't he when he he never left his home. His his mother died in the in the chair, and he just basically inherited the house and and wherever things dropped the day she passed away was where it stayed for for another 50 years until we had to come in and, and, and move him out and move him into our house and care for him. So I remember one time I was making bread and um, he was just, he just didn't get it. He was, he gave me such a hard time. Why, why are you making things from scratch? You know, you can just open up a can of Chef Boyardee. It's already ready to go. Just dump it. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. and, and, and you're, you're, you got diabetes, you got bladder cancer, and, and, and you wonder why you're in the shape that you're in? You know? No, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, and, Uncle Larry. And just to, without, without taking us too far off, you know, this wisdom of, uh, of fasting in different cultures that we have with uh, fasting, usually around religion, but now it's become more popular with health and fitness. And if you notice when you're doing intermittent fasting, clear liquids are okay. And so I always start with my ginger tea in the morning, mm -hmm. my ginger green tea. And it sounds fancy, but I have loose leaf green tea now i've been adding lemon ball oh. uh that i learned that from you how's the lemon ball uh, going <laughs> i love it I are you noticing any it. difference are you feeling it are you feeling calm i don't know uh my husband's still alive so. <laughs> <laughs> he can pay me later <laughs> 
That's funny. <laughs> I don't know. I, that's usually my my go to. Um, <laughs> but I, I I love it. You know, it, and the um I, I I cut a piece of ginger root and I stick it inside there and it just kind of marinates and you know I feel first of all I feel like I'm cleaning out. Like I'll go right to the bathroom and probably TMI for people, but if you want to um, refresh your body, this is such an easy way. I mean, why would I take uh, medicine first, right? Mm -hmm. If you have, if you want to detox your body from whatever you ate the day before, why would you go with something that's not natural and just a simple washing out of your system with the herbs that will caringly and lovingly uh, allow for you to urinate, you know, to just clean out your mm -hmm. system. Yeah. Um, well, I and think a lot of it is education. You know, people there's, I mean, Teresa, you see this all the time where so much is thrown at us, you know, we're constantly bombarded you know, do this for this, do that for that, do this, da, 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 da. and um, one of the things that I've, I've learned from, from herbalism is, you know, sometimes sim simple, keep it simple. Um, the, the most simplest things like, you know, adding lemon balm to your, to your uh, water, warming your water, having warm water with lemon really helps with, with the gut. Um, <clears throat> As I had shared with you before, I've I've never been able to fast because um, I just I don't know what the twenty four hour fast or even forty I, I barely can do fifteen hours and that's taken me years to work up. Uh, it took me about a month and a half to constantly to to have my myself focused on okay I can fast definitely 12 hours. That's not a big deal. Then I moved it to 13 hours and I could tell that my head, you know, I was starting to get ringing in my ears. I was starting to, to feel woozy. Um, I was getting jittery. And so then I stopped it at 13 and I just worked on 13 and then I moved it to 14. And then now I'm at 15 and a half. Now, What's interesting is that I actually emailed my my physician and I asked him, were there any long term effects of, of fasting? If I do this 15 to 16 hours every single day for the rest of my life, are there any long term health effects? <laughs> and his response was, I don't know how to answer your question. So I thought that was pretty revealing that even a medical doctor. Um, who's been after me about my weight for a long time, couldn't answer the question whether long-term fasting would, how, how it affects our bodies. And when I did do some research, um, Harvard and um, the Mayo Clinic said that at this time, um, there are no long-term effects, that there's no, there's no conclusive evidence, I should say. So if you have any evidence about that, I'd love to know because I'm just going to go ahead and do it and, um, and see what happens. First of all, um, the, uh, the 15 hours that you're doing based on the research that I've seen is more than adequate. Okay. And most of the time when I, it's called intermittent fasting. Okay. Most of the time, um, that is what I'm doing. I'm doing around 16 hours. Um, but if it's 14 or if it's 15, that's fine. It's more of a way of life for me. Um, what I have read in the um, research from registered dietitians is that basically it helps us control a little bit more um, in terms of diet. It helps us control a little bit more the window mm -hmm. of when we are going to eat food. If that doesn't work for you and you end up bouncing back and eating double because you've been holding on a ledge for so long, then intermittent fasting isn't for you. Um, that's one side of it based on the research. Um, Another thing that I've read is that basically by delaying the time that you have 
that you're eating, you're giving your body time to absorb what you've eaten the day before. And you're giving it the time to work through the digestive process and the cleaning out process. And a lot of people who, uh, that part that part of the theory is, goes along with chewing properly. It's more digestive driven and cleaning out your body and your system driven. Mm-hmm. Now in all of the intermittent fasting that I've read, it just really works for me because I've gotten, and, and this is what I've read and this is what really works for me is that I will, in allowing that time between meals, it doesn't mean that I'm not having anything to drink um, during that time. Mm-hmm. In the morning, I will have my tea, my green tea and my, <clears throat> excuse me, my um, ginger, as I mentioned to you. And that kind of flushes my system. I went through a phase where I was doing lemon water. It really depends. Basically, it's the warm herbal water for Mm -hmm. me. And it will, it's literally like I'm taking a shower from the inside. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it awakens me. And I feel like it helps me digest better. It helps everything work better. And Personally, ever since I started doing this, I have become more regular. I have been able to control cravings. I have been able to um, have a more stable weight. I have more energy. My stomach feels light. I don't have as much bloating as I used to. So for me, it works. But again, there is so much out there, and you have to go with the science Mm -hmm. and your body yeah that's you know it's not to be all and end all there are days where i have i come off of a fast and i'm just having it and those aren't good days you know it doesn't happen often but there could be other things going on maybe it's hormones Mm -hmm. maybe it's a change in the weather there are a lot of things you do need to listen to stress stress if you're stressed you know, yeah. we do that, that, uh, the stress eating. Yeah. Yeah. It can be stress. It can be any number of things. I tend to go into hibernation mode. I feel it very intensely when the weather changes mm-hmm. and it starts to get cold. I tend to crave foods that will help me pack on the calories mm-hmm. like I'm a bear or something. And it's kind of funny. <laughs> Well, but that's, but that's our human nature. I mean, you know, that's our human nature. That's what our, you know, that's what we are supposed to do. I mean, you live in the Northern country, Northern United, you know, States. And, and when it gets cold, our body, it's listening to our bodies. We, we want those comfort foods. We want those more starchy foods. Um, And, and, and as you know, that's where we, we start, we, we should switch to the root vegetables um, instead of the light leafy greens. You know, I notice that all the time with me. Um, when the minute it gets cold, man, I'm craving those stews, the carrots and the parsnips and, and, and all that stuff. So, yeah. And in the summertime, it's for me, it's tomatoes and anything that comes off a vine or a tree. And yeah. I'm always, I have the most energy, you know, it's vitamin D, I have the most energy. Because we want, we want lighter. Our bodies naturally, you know, dropping those pounds, lightening things up. Um, It doesn't want those heavy, heavy starches. Um, Does it, you know, it's just, again, it's our bodies are cyclical. So yeah, I just bought 48 tomato plants yesterday. I didn't grow, I didn't start them from seed. Paul didn't want me to to bother with it this year. So we, we went out and I got my, my little tomatoes from, um, from a a local nursery here, 48, 48 girls, little babies. Wow. That's wonderful. Yep. Yeah. I mean, and this is, again, this is the time where, um, one of my favorite salads is tabbouleh salad. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It Mm -hmm. does have the cracked wheat, but, um, it, it is basically chopped herbs, right? You have your mm-hmm. mint, you have your, um, your, uh, uh, I kept wanting it, parsley. I was going to say cilantro, but it's not cilantro. Definitely not cilantro. It's parsley, <laughs> it's mint, 
it's onion, fresh onion, tomato, uh, that you can have a little bit of cucumber in there, but that's more the fatouche version. Mm -hmm. But there's so many salads that you can, uh, that are really finely chopped herbs that get pickled. Mm -hmm. And you can add them as a side dish to your main salad, or you can, I love to have like a cold beet salad in mm -hmm. the fridge. Mm -hmm. You know, and all of that for me is, is really, uh, uh, I feel that when I'm eating these foods, I feel the energy. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid and my aunt Dina was telling me all these herbs and all the nutritional benefits of everything she was putting on my plate, I didn't quite get it because whatever I ate filled my belly and then I was mm -hmm. off to the next thing. Yep. Yeah. But yeah. now my kids get it. That's good. So I managed to show them some things and they'll be like, for example, my kids came from school one day and said, mom, what's a happy meal? Everybody's talking about a happy meal. Where do you get a happy <laughs> You're not meal? in the know. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had no idea. So we, my husband took them to McDonald's and got them a Happy Meal, and they took the toy out, and they said, okay, what's for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They even looked at it and said, we're not going to eat that. So I think it's a testament to um, the time and us, Making this yeah, good mothering, good parenting. <laughs> oh, thank you. But it's this this work that you do is so important, Brenda, because people we I feel like there's almost a generation skip that we skip mm -hmm. with the information that my aunt was passing in my grandmothers and my mom, all the women, the mother figures in my life were passing down to me. Not everybody has it. No, my husband didn't. His mother, his mother didn't know any of it. You know, here even though her mother came from the old country, you know, she was she came over from Italy off the boat. Um, she didn't. From what I, oh, by the time I met her, she had Alzheimer's. Um, but she didn't. She didn't pass that information down. She didn't. Nutrition was not really, you know. She put food on the table, and it was to. It was more of a a, a utilitarian process it wasn't something that you know it was just a, a job that needed to get done and here here's your food eat it and it wasn't according to my husband it wasn't all that great um she she could really inflict some damage on a poor egg and um for years and years and years he wouldn't he wouldn't eat eggs until until finally i just stopped telling him what he was eating and i just said look you want to eat here it is and and now he eats eggs and um he there's a lot of things that he doesn't he he wouldn't eat in the in our early days but because you know the way you cook it the way you season it with herbs um it, and the fact that he's healthy he is really healthy um and his labs show it um that it's because he's getting good nutrition um and it's not painful so, um, yeah. yeah. And let me, let me just, uh, address very quickly, if you, if I may, the elephant in the room here about, you know, women, uh, passing this down, because when you say wise woman, and I'm talking about my aunt and my grandmother, she's my a mother, wise woman. She's um, tradition. She's technically, are, yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, and wherever we are today, is not what we're talking about in terms of equality or if this is a feminine no. role. These are things that were handed down to us that were traditionally feminine roles. Yes. That were traditionally handed down by um, women, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, there are there were uh, there was also that school of thought that. If we don't teach our daughter to cook, then she will be more masculine and she will be more, um, she'll have a better chance at life because she'll be focused on her studies and that's, that's our contribution to women's empowerment, you know? Yeah. And, and I'm not arguing for or against any of that, but I just kind of want to address this, especially because it's going to be played back and people are going to listen to it that, 
you know, this isn't up until today, at least, this was predominantly something that's why it's called white women, white women, yeah. right? It was predominantly handed down from generation to generation. Well, there's different, yeah, there's different, you know, you could be a, a shaman, you could be a spiritualist, um, you know, my my role is is education, is teaching people better health. I mean, yes, you're absolutely right. This is not a feminist thing. This isn't a dig. There's a lot of women who choose, who uh, chose education um, because they were the, they're going to, they want to be able to support themselves. So, um we um so we're not we're not we're not bashing but yeah um there's a there is a gap there is a gap and um you know i it's the reason why i like to go back to the historic record because of the fact that there is such a gap and that is you know if you are a ceo and you're running a multi-billion dollar company and you're a woman god bless you um, but I, but you know, again, we need to be aware that there are easier ways for our health, getting back to the planet, getting back to, to the plant life, you know, what they call ethnobotany, which is the cult, learning the other cultures of, of how they cared for each other is, and honoring those, those different cultures, um, and I think that it, wherever you are in the part of the world, if there is a, a, wise man, wise woman yeah, that you can learn from um, the old, some of the old, even if it's just wives. I mean, you know, my grandmother, I remember visiting my grandmother in Michigan and I walked into the kitchen and she's swigging um, a shot glass of, of vinegar. And I'm like, and she has this horrible face, look on her face. And I thought she was nuts. And I'm like, what are you doing? And somebody in her church group told her that um, she could live a better, healthier life if she swigged apple cider vinegar um, every day. And so she had her, her or was a, a spoon, I guess she was, she was using, I mean, and that, that kind of stuck with me. And it wasn't until years later that I discovered in, in my herbal studies that um, that fire, <laughs> fire cider is a fermented organic vinegar. What she was doing was using distilled vinegar and it wasn't going to do anything other than give her reflux um, and also do a damage to her enamel on her teeth. Um, but there is science behind uh, fermented, uh, the organic fermented vinegar as being not only weight loss, but also boosting immune system. But you, but the fire cider that I make, you add, and this is, this dates back years, years to the original plague where um, in France, the black plague was, uh, people were were dousing their rags and stuff with uh, vinegar, and that's how they were able to m not get the plague number one and deal with the the dead. Um, and so this recipe has called Four Thieves, and it's brought forward in Rosemary Gladstar. She is an herbalist up in Vermont. She is you know another icon in the herbal world. And she revolutionized the recipe in the 70s and, and named it Fire Cider. And um, my grandmother was close, but she was just, you know, she was in the right church, but the wrong pew. You know, she needed the organic or um, vinegar versus the distilled vinegar. And she needed to add some alliums, onions, garlics, you know, some other um, and, and horseradish, and that's basically the basis of the recipe. And she ferment you ferment it for six weeks, and then you, when you got a cold or you're not feeling great, you take a shot glass of it. And um, because I'm getting reflex now, I don't do it every day. But when I'm not feeling well, um, and occasionally, and my sister in law, you know, she's she's uh, Asian heritage, and she's got terrible, terrible, terrible allergies. And I sent her out a, a, you know, 
some some fire cider and my brother my brother's like holy cow she's swearing by this stuff and and you know he won't go near it but uh you know i chase paul through the house you know here honey here's your here's your here's your fire you got a sniffle here let me have you and he runs um but you know he'll take it and he does get better and we're all better but anyway <laughs> gotta love the old ways um, so what else you got there? Anything else? Um, yeah, I was I was thinking back um, to all of the revenues, and uh, I remember again with my uh, aunt and my uh, Greek grandmother, particularly, who would caution against sugar and would caution against things like coffee or too much chocolate or or overindulgence. Like every time if we had a tummy ache as we were kids growing up, they would say, oh, well, did you eat your vegetables or did you eat this? Or of course you have a tummy ache, you're eating sugar. Mm -hmm. Like there was such a relationship with food and nurturing um the body right mm -hmm. it was all about you know oh what do you need oh you need you have a tummy ache i'm gonna whip you up some some soup you mm -hmm. know or mm -hmm. some tea the jewish uh, grandma the jewish mother's chicken soup how many have you heard tales about the jewish uh mother's chicken soup and how it can cure any any cold. I heard that a lot when I was growing up. I don't know well, what she yeah, put. And the Greeks, the Greeks have a version. Oh, they do? Okay, like so what do they. Here in the South, somebody. Oh, yeah, I think every culture has a version. There's something in chicken soup. Um, and I believe it has to do with the bone broth. Now, mind you, I am plant based, mm. but if my kids are sick, I will grab chicken and i will boil the bones you know chicken with the bones and yeah. give it to them and it works like a charm every time there's something in the bones of the chicken not just the meat and uh, i didn't know whether it was the, the herbs you know the, the garlic. again the garlic and the onions and those those uh the thyme thyme is great it is another it's another um uh, it, you, we, you you can do an inhalation if you're really stuffy you can um, take a bowl of hot water and put your thyme in the bowl and put a towel over your head and do steam inhalations to help break up the congestion and i was just wondering whether the the thyme in the chicken soup was helping to thin the mucus as as well as well as the onions and garlic some versions use a time, but the traditional uh, Greek version, I don't know about the Jewish version, but the traditional Greek version has a lot of lemon. Okay. And again, it's not necessarily an herb. It has bay leaf and lemon. Well, lemon does um, the, uh, is also something that, that, again, lemon and honey for a sore throat. Again, it, the lemon, the essential oils in the lemon also help break up the mucus. So there, there it is. It's just a different, it's something substituted. So that's interesting. Lemon, you use lemon, a lot of lemon in your chicken soup. Hmm, that sounds yummy. Yeah, do you know what's in the Jewish one? I'm trying to look it up now, hence my delay. Mm, no, I don't. I, I don't know. Well, I don't know. I, the, I, I don't know if I have a copy. No, I don't think so. I just made yeah, my I'll own version. Yeah, so we have, uh, there's, yeah, there's a lot of lemon juice and onion in the Greek one. That's the only other thing. I use bay leaf, mm -hmm. um, but I'm looking up um, Jewish chicken soup so if anybody's you. watching this and you're you have you're jewish or you have a jewish mother grandmother who has this soup recipe please put it down in the comments we we would love to know or email me um you know join my newsletter here's uh let me just put this up here 
uh, join my newsletter. It's livinginloveandherbs.com forward slash Friday. And then you can email me. Um, I'd love to know the herbs. I, I always use the traditional New England version recipe that I had um, gotten. Oh, gosh. And what some old little pamphlet. I had collected these tiny you know, little booklets like these, the first American cookbook, you know, American cookery, 1796. Um, I also I used, you know, you can see how beat up this cookbook is. This is the old Sturbridge cookbook. This is, again, part of my my um, American studies. I, I My uh, major was uh, the colonial period. And I don't know if they've got a recipe in here or not. Oh, the shakers. They have a, I used, to, I have their shaker, the shaker recipe book, which was, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the shakers, but they are an icon here in the Northeast. Well, um, the herbs, they had a huge apothecary. They, they had ton, a huge business in the late 1700s or 18 through the 1800s until basically they were, they, the Shakers were a, a religious group that did not, um, they were like a commune. Um, there was marriage was not allowed, although you could come in as a family, but you weren't allowed to marry once you were part of the community. And it was started by a woman by the name of Anne Lees from England who came over, who was being persecuted for for religion and you know they were known for shaking and during their religious and, and dancing and um they uh, they put out a lot of really good information they were quality quality herbs they had a huge uh seed catalog and herbal apothecary their doctors were known all over new england um so i collected i started collecting theirs oh here we go do they have soup in here broth 8081 let's see what they have what do you have did you find anything Teresa? yes i did what did you find i think you're gonna like it Ooh. okay so um jewish uh chicken soup has this version has yellow onion an entire yellow onion mm -hmm. eight carrots one parsnip three cloves of garlic crushed two stalks of celery one whole bunch of fresh dill weed. Dill. 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 Okay. Yep. And then that's that's it for the vegetables. Then you have the masa, you have the eggs, the oil, the chicken, the salt. Huh. Dill. But dill. dill. Okay. So here and is I have another one. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Another one that that is that they titled Jewish penicillin. <laughs> okay, all right, and, that's what we want. Uh, it's again, actually it only adds black peppercorns and cloves and bay leaves. Oh, parsley, parsley. no wonder. Okay, okay, so this one has, yeah, this one has carrots, celery, onions, parsnips, peppercorns, cloves, bay leaves, parsley, Dill. Okay. Oh I gotta try this. So they have part they have pepper peppers and cloves. Again, it's another aromatic that opens up the the congestion, breaks it up, thins it up. Um, so they're using um the dill surprises me. I wasn't expecting the dill. Um that's a that's a that's not a usual um aromatic uh a herb that's not at least from in my experience dill is not something that is used for for congestion but they're using it hmm interesting okay so i have the uh from the sturbridge and this this recipe comes from this is the original book that i have if you're why um I'm showing this on YouTube, uh, Teresa. So this is the American Frugal Housewife. It was uh, published by uh, Mrs. Child. And she says it's dedicated to those who were not ashamed of economy. And um, this was published in 1833 in Boston. And um, so this is like the first, here's a copy of it. So this is like the first early American cookbook of its day. And um, 
it's uh it's it's <laughs> yeah it's you it's it's unreadable you can't you know good luck trying to read this so what Sturbridge village did was that they tran kind of translated the old english into modern english and here's the cookbook so their chicken broth is water rice salt pepper nutmeg one whole onion parsley and crumbled crackers so they have parsley and onion and nutmeg that's a new one nutmeg and yours the jewish one has cloves so i like to put a little bit of cloves in the chicken soup uh when i used to eat chicken soup because for me it killed the chicken smell i don't like the smell of poultry okay uh even before i was plant-based um years ago so i would add a couple of cloves and um in terms of dill dill is uh if you think of it is dill is like the cilantro of the mediterranean cuisine okay it's something people like or hate um and it's often added everywhere it's highly nutritious i don't remember um what exactly well hang I on i got that, that answer be, okay i, I think it on. could be that the dill is there uh because it's a familiar flavor like it's a it's a something okay also. so i have but i know parsley okay yeah. so i have this book it's um i don't know if it's still in print i i happen to find this used it's called nutritional herbology a guide a reference guide to herbs so in this book it gives you all the uh, nutrition it has the nutritional profile so let me look up dill if it's in here doesn't have every every herb but it's uh something that i when i'm developing recipes this is what i i go to now i don't think it has dill in here has done quite <laughs> Come on, turn the page. Or stuck or something. Um. Yeah, it doesn't have dill, so I don't know what the answer is. Um, but I've seen dill recently. It keeps popping up in in other in other herb books. Um. Hmm. No, it's not in here. I'm finding it in other books and other recipes. Um, <clears throat> so I'm finding uh, that it's rich in vitamin A and vitamin C. Okay. But as an aromatic um, for somebody who has a cold, um, that's fascinating. Somebody needs to do a study on that. <laughs> if it works, don't yeah. question it. Just use it. Just go for it. You know? Don't question yeah. it. Well, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's not very like um, it's not very uh, um, uh, pungent, if you will. It's lighter. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, dill. Yeah, you know. To, from the herbal perspective, I know dill is, um, you know, again, it could be okay. Back if you trace back even further so the language of herbs the meanings of herbs there um i know dill is supposed to ward off the witches so in weddings um some brides would have a sprig of dill in their bouquet or somewhere as part of the wedding ceremony so i'm wondering whether the dill is part of that old school um you know to war if you're being possessed or you're being hexed by by a witch and that's why you're ill that that's they just throw the dill in there i'm wondering if that's that's the where that came from and it just you know the old saying you know you you have a ham and you cut the i don't know if you've ever heard this story where this woman no. has a ham and she's cutting the she's cutting it off and somebody asks her why do you do that she's i don't know my mother did it and so the girl asked her mother my mother says i don't know my mother did it and then 
they ask the great grandmother and the grandmother says, cause it to, to fit it in the pan, you know? So <laughs> all these three, four generations later, they're cutting the leg off because <laughs> you know, the original grandma had a small pan. So, <laughs> oh, geez. That's so funny. Yeah. No, I'm seeing here that it's rich in vitamin A. Okay. That's what I'm seeing. It's rich in vitamin A. And it has zinc and it has potassium okay. and iron. Um, so, but nothing really uh, extraordinary, mm -hmm. I have to say. It's vitamin A is fourteen percent of your daily value, and vitamin C is twelve percent of your uh, daily value. And I guess you'd have to look at it's one per cup. Mm -hmm. So it's not extraordinary uh, in terms of the value, but I don't know how it relates to other to other herbs. Yeah, I don't know. That's interesting, fascinating. Interesting. Something to to learn. I love these. That's one of the, you know. I love these talks, and I love these uh, this show that you do, and uh, learning from you because who knew? Now I get to go back and look up something that you know I was kind of taking for granted. Uh, dill. We eat a lot of dill. Yeah. Um, in, in Greek cuisine, it goes in our spinach pies, it goes in our dolmades, it goes, you know, uh, on fish, seafood, uh, you know, you see, you see dill a lot. It's definitely in every respectable Greek yeah. garden. <laughs> yeah, no, it'll be interesting. Oh, you know, does it grow wild in Greece? grow wild in Greece also it's one of those very hardy ones mm -hmm. and it attracts these beautiful caterpillars um, but uh, I yeah I just I keep getting this image of my grandmother's garden but I can't really say I mean she cultivated everything yeah yeah so, and we used a lot of, my mother used to make pickles, uh, canned pickles. We'd go out to the farm and pick up the yep. cucumbers and she would buy these big, they would grow. I mean, it grew very well out in the area that we grew up in. And, you know, I just remember as a kid, you know, picking, picking the, the sprigs of, of dill. Uh, I don't use it very often in my, in my cuisine, just because it's just something that I, I you know, parsley and there's tons of, I use a lot of parsley. I use a lot of cinnamon, a lot of cloves, a lot of nutmeg. Um, I use different aromatic garlic. Ooh, we're, we're, we're never without garlic yeah. here. Lemon, lemon is another aromatic that I use all the time. Um, in my cooking, but dill's just something that it's just something I've gotten away from. Um, but anyway, cool. All righty. Well, it's 11 o'clock and I don't want to keep you because it's Mother's Day. So I will um, we'll wrap up and um, I wish you a happy Mother's Day. And uh, oh, to all, thank you. Likewise, thank you. And to all the mothers out there that are watching this on YouTube, Happy Mother's Day to you, and may you be blessed. Have a blessed day. And Teresa, I will catch up with you later. Thank you, dear. All right. For having me, and thanks for this great conversation. Well, thank See you. I learned Sunday something. At Ten o'clock Eastern. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Every Sunday at ten o'clock, we'll be here. All right, my dear, Mwah. happy blessings to Mwah. you, and um, we'll you. catch you, you later. Okay, dear. Bye. Bye. All right, everybody. We have ended on Clubhouse, and thank you for watching. And again, if you're a Jewish mom out there or you make chicken soup, let us know. We'd love to have... Um, the information and I uh, share it. And if you know the reason why dill is in, in chicken soup, um, love to know that too, other than a seasoning. Um, but thank you and happy Mother's Day. We'll see you next time on Living and Loving Herbs.